Hello, and welcome to the Virtual Scandinavia House and today's book talk with the New York Times bestselling author, Herman, Arthur Herman, discussing his latest book, The Viking's Heart, uh, Now How Scandinavia Conquered the World, published by Mariner Books. This talk is being recorded and will be made available on our website at scandinavias.org, as well as our YouTube page. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat box and we'll get to them towards the end of the program. A link to where one can purchase the books will also be added to the chat box. Arthur Herman is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, New York Times bestselling author of 10 books, including How the Scots Invented the Modern World, Gandhi and Churchill, Douglas MacArthur, American Warrior, as well as A Freedom Forge, How American Business Produced Victory in World War II, which, uh, which The Economist magazine listed as one of the most outstanding books of 2012 which is required reading at various military academies and the National Defense University. Dr. Herman is currently a senior fellow at Hudson Institute and director of the Hudson's Quantum Alliance Initiative. He writes frequently for the Wall Street Journal and the National Review. He's also he also has a regular column at, for column at Forbes.com on technology and national security pol policies. So please welcome Dr. Herman. Hey. Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here with you, all of you, if only virtually. Um, I do enjoy uh, talking to live audiences, but you know, if, if virtual is, uh, is almost as good um, and certainly better than not being able to talk to you at all. Um, the, this book, my 10th, is in many ways uh, the most personal for me. Uh, the title, The Viking Heart, How Scandinavians Conquered the World, is a book that really uh, reflects um, both my interest as an historian, uh, but also my interest in family roots and in the role of Scandinavian Americans and the Scandinavian experience uh, and the way in which it has come to shape America and I think will continue to shape it in the future. So the book is in many ways a kind of an amalgam of, on the one hand, uh, if you like medieval history, even ancient history, certainly for the first part as I talk about the Vikings. And then the second part um, is focused primarily, but not exclusively on the Scandinavian American uh, immigration and of the experiences that Scandinavian Americans had, Danes, Swedes, Norwegians, and Finns, uh, but also the role that they came to play in shaping American history, particularly in the 20th century, but even up through today. Now, people ask me, how is it in your 10th book that you finally got around to doing something about your family um, and about your family heritage? Full disclosure, uh, on my mother's side, both of her parents came over from uh, Norway just before World War I. And on my father's side, um, he uh, has a, a great great grandfather, who, great grandfather who came over, my great great grandfather, who came over from Norway in the 1850s, just in time to serve in the American Civil War. And when you read the Viking Heart, you'll learn a lot about him and about his experiences, uh, both in the war and afterwards. But this book, uh, really, the germination for it came um, when I had published my New York Times bestselling book, How the Scots Invented the Modern World. Um, it was, I have to say, a big success it became a big surprise. I had no idea there was so much interest in, in the part of Scottish Americans and others and their heritage and on the impact that Scots had had, the Scottish thinkers had had on the world and on America. And after one of the book events that I did, my uncle, my uncle Norman, my mother's older brother and grandma Anna's oldest son came up to me and said, so you've covered the Scots. Now what are you gonna do about the Vikings? Um, very direct man, my uncle Norman. And so I said, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do with them. I haven't really sort of thought about what uh, I might wanna write or might wanna say about the Vikings. Of course, I knew right away that he was interested, not just in a book about the Viking experience, but a book that would talk about his and his family's Scandinavian roots. Uh, and it would talk about all the different ways in which uh, the Scandinavian legacy had been uh, was shaped by 
and continue to be shaped by the uh, by the experience and the history legacy that the Vikings had left behind. So it was a long germination, almost 20 years between that book and this one. And in that period of time, my uncle's question never really sort of left the back of my mind. And it wasn't until about three years ago that I decided I was ready to write this book, ready to write it in the sense of not just wanting to write about the Vikings as a as a as an historical people and an experience in history. I was trained as a medievalist. That was my original interest as an historian. So it was a chance to get back to my, if you like, intellectual and historical roots. But also because I began to sense more and more that there was a larger message contained in the story of the Vikings and the story of their descendants in America and also in Scandinavia. One, that, a message that contained certain, shall we say, important values, important values and important skills, and I use that term in, this, in, in almost a sort of craftsman-like sense, of certain skills that were part of the way in which Vikings lived uh, at their time, but that developed into a cluster <clears throat> of skills and, in, and, and, and ca capabilities that they left to their ancestors, to their descendants. And it then came over and it was brought over by those immigrants in the 19th and 20th centuries. So that was really the shaping of the book. That what I wanted was a book that was not just about the Viking experience, but it was also about the human experience. The human experience is seen through the lens of particular ethnic groups. And I use groups in term so that we can talk not just about the Nordic countries as a linguistic <clears throat> or cultural unit, but also to be able to include the Finns and the Finnish experience as part of this, and to really sort of see what its legacy is and how it's helped to shape not just the past and the present, but also looking ahead to where it would go in the future. But first, of course, I should really say something about the Vikings, shouldn't I? And so for that reason, I guess we should put up the first slide. Now that first slide, as you see, is a very familiar image to those who know Viking history. Uh, it's a set of chessmen that were discovered on the Isle of Lewis, which were made just about the end of the Viking Age, on towards about the 12th century, maybe 11th century, 12th century. Um, uh, ones that were almost certainly uh, shaped by, if not uh, descendants of Vikings, certainly those who had had encounters and probably trading uh, connections with them. One of the things that DNA science has been able to bring to us in terms of, and DNA analysis has really changed a lot of the way in which we think about Viking history and the role of the Vikings. Um, it's one of the one of the key, I think, uh, ingredients to modern archaeology that I talk about in the book and understanding the Viking experience. But we now, though we know, thanks to DNA analysis, that this ivory chest set was actually made from the ivory of narwhal tusks, narwhal tusks from Greenland. In other words, that Viking traders had brought them from Greenland to the Western Scotland uh, as part of the trading routes that the Vikings had established between those two outposts, those two outposts of, uh, of the Norsemen uh, and, their, uh, and, and their economy and culture. But, that image that we see of these warriors here, particularly that first one, the warrior biting his shield, uh, is almost kind of our stereotype of Viking warriors, the one that's been passed down through popular culture, in the movies, uh, as well as in uh, fiction and nonfiction, of a kind of race of super warriors as rapers, and pillagers, and plunderers who devastated Northern Europe and who destroyed or looted everything on their path. And the image of the berserker, who either through combination of sort of psychological preparation or possibly something, possibly uh, certain kinds of, uh, of trance-inducing drugs had taken on the characteristics of sort of an animal-like 
quality of savagery and ferocity in battle here. Now, what we have to say is like a lot of cultural stereotypes, um, the stereotype about the Vikings in the Viking Age contains a fair amount of truth to it. Um, the Vikings were pretty fearsome warriors, <clears throat> especially in the eyes of their opponents. In many cases, had never met people like this uh, who were able to strike at will and appear out of nowhere unexpectedly from the sea or from, or from river courses. Um, had never uh, run across a, a, in, in dark age Christian Europe, uh, a race of pagan peoples who had, paid, who had no respect for uh, Christian shrines or churches or monasteries, quite the opposite, and saw them as uh, sources of loot, as uh, sources of mobility of wealth to be taken away and brought home. Uh, that's definitely the picture of the Norsemen we get from medieval chronicles. It's the picture that in many cases the Norsemen themselves like to project uh, when they wanted to think about themselves as part of a as part of a warrior culture and a warrior class uh, who were able to dominate, even though they came in small numbers from small uh, and, and land of, of small resources, who were able to dominate and sweep across Northern Europe and even into the Mediterranean Europe with impunity. There's a lot of truth to that, but it's not the whole truth. And what I try to show in the book is talk about who the real Vikings were. But who, what was the real Viking experience? And what we come to realize is, as I explain in the Viking heart, is, is that far from being a race of super warriors or professional pillagers and plunderers, that they were in fact um, the, kind of, the kind of people for whom the voyages, the raiding that they engaged in was only a part-time activity. Uh, that most of them were in fact farmers, uh, fishermen, uh, hunters, and uh, uh, animal herdsmen, and that the voyages that they set out on every spring um, from their fjords and from their uh, water inlets in Scandinavia were ways to find and procure the goods, particularly manufactured goods, commodities, that they were going to need in order to survive in a climate which was unforgiving and uh, which spared no one under those kinds of fearsome uh, circumstances. So the picture of the, of, the, of the Viking has to include two sides to his and her life. The first side, the one reflected in the medieval chronicles and our usual image of the Vikings themselves, but the other of family, men and women, going about their lives, uh, spending their time tilling their fields, tending to their livestock, raising family, working together in the community, uh, but who are prepared when the spring thaw comes to go out and find the things that they need to make the community safe and secure and to make the communities prosper. Now, in order to do this, given the fact that they um, lived in small numbers in a very hostile environment, uh, really cut off and at the margins of the mainstream of European and Western civilization. What enabled them to engage in this kind of far-flung enterprise was uh, technology. And that was the technology of the longship. If you want to go to the next slide. And what we know from stone monuments dating back to the very early, very early Iron Age, a couple hundred years before the Viking Age. This is a stone monument, uh, probably at the, at the early part of the Viking era, eighth or ninth centuries uh, from Tanu in Sweden. And we can see here the representation of the Viking peoples themselves, of Scandinavians themselves. Of, what, of their own self-image, if you like, as voyagers, um, as seafarers. And we see the, the, the longship uh, represented here with its crew ready for battle. But the, long, the technology was really, it came in two parts. The first was the longship itself, uh, which had on the one hand, a very shallow draft, which allowed it to move from sea to inland 
navigation, including up rivers, uh, in ways that a, a, your normal sea-going or even ocean-going ship would not be able to do. Combined with combined with the square sail, which gave it uh, enormous speed and mobility, as well as the as well as the uh, having the ability to basically go anywhere that a Viking chieftain and his crew wanted to go. And it's the combination of those two technologies that made the Vikings such a threat to their neighbors. The shock and awe tactics that they brought to bear um, on their neighbors who were unable to defend themselves, at least in the beginning of the Viking Age, uh, was one that uh, completely changed the face of Europe uh, and transformed Europe into a, uh, into a fortress to defend against the Viking marauders. The Viking Age itself, sort of the heyday of these uh, marauding expeditions um, being conducted uh, every spring by Swedish and Danish and Norwegian uh, uh, chieftains and captains, probably runs from about 795. That's often the date that's used for the uh, first significant raid on the English monastery at Lindisfarne, which I talk about at the beginning of the book. And then it ends usually at about 1066 with the Battle of Hastings, when the last great uh, Norwegian Viking king, uh, Harold, is defeated by, well, <laughs> his namesake, the Harold King of England at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Harold King of England will then go south to be defeated by William the Conqueror at Hastings. Uh, but the decisive defeat of the Norwegians at Stamford Bridge, just outside York, usually marks the end of what we think of as the Viking Age as such. Now, during that period of time, from 790s through uh, into, the, it, into the 11th century, these intrepid bands of Norwegian, Swedish, Danish sailors and seafarers ventured far out in a series of wide arcs across the waterways of Northern Europe. Um, each of the different uh, ethnic groupings pursuing a different course and going in a different direction. The Swedes, for example, uh, together with the Finns who accompanied them on these expeditions, uh, tended to go to the east and spread out across the Baltic, down the river courses in Russia, down the Dnieper and the Dniester and the Don, uh, all the way down to the Black Sea, and from the Black Sea uh, all the way down to the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, Constantinople, which they besieged a couple of times unsuccessfully uh, and managed to wring out of the Byzantines a couple of very favorable trade deals. The uh, Danes uh, concentrated most of their efforts in the area across, on the other side of the North Sea, uh, focusing primarily on uh, England, particularly Northern England. Uh, but eventually by the 11th, by the 11th century, they con they've conquered really, well, let's say by the 10th century, they conquered almost two thirds of England is under Danish rule um, in a series of, of, of lightning raids followed by, by intense military campaigning, uh, and then expanding, extending down into Northern France, and then eventually along the coast of Spain, all the way into the Mediterranean as far as Athens. The Norwegians tended to follow a different arc. Their arc took them further west, uh, across Scotland to Ireland, where Norwegian uh, chieftains set up a series of settlements and kingdoms, including, of course, Dublin, which was originally a Viking settlement. Then reaching across to the Faroe Islands, to Iceland, Greenland, and then finally, at the end of long treks, uh, winding up uh, at the coast of North America which is where they enter the American story really for the first time in about 1000 AD. Um, if going to go to the next slide. This is the uh, statue, uh, the rather romanticized uh, image of 
the uh, Norwegian adventurer who is uh, supposed to have led those first, the first voyage to reach North America, Leif Erikson, uh, my Norwegian grandmother's great hero, and also my Norwegian grandfather's. Um, and we know that he landed uh, at around 1,000, somewhere or in, on the North American coast, probably not New England, although, although for a long time there was, there were scholars who thought there was evidence showing Viking settlements there. But the, what archeological evidence exists shows that they did in fact land instead, that the landing took place instead uh, in Newfoundland at uh, Lons au Medo, the Meadow Cove there. Um, and uh, that statue of Leif Erikson uh, was erected there to mark the spot where the Norsemen originally, originally set up. Probably not a full-scale settlement, more likely probably just sort of a boat landing and a place to winter um, as well. But enough relics remain, enough archeological remains to suggest that people did spend some time there, almost certainly engaged in trade with the local uh, native tribes and population, and then eventually abandoned it, uh, probably about the time that the mother settlement in Greenland, the mother settlement in Greenland, wound down uh, and became less and less frequented as the climate changed, the weathers got colder, and it became less and less uh, a, a draw for immigrants or for the settlers who wanted to stay there. So with Leif Erikson, we come to the story really of, and, and we come to the other end of the story of the Vikings per se, the Vikings as the establishments, the, really the precursors of globalization because the great trading routes that they established that sprang up from their original pillaging raids become the basis for sea routes across the Atlantic across the Baltic, uh, the river courses in Russia into Eastern Europe, uh, and eventually linking up even to Baghdad, where Viking traders we know later on would establish trade links and connections. This is an incredible story. It's an incredible story of her. When you think about the small population coming from an inhospitable environment with very meager resources, and yet the secret of it, the secret of it was the culture that they were able to build out of that fierce, forbidding environment, one in which it was always understood that survival depended upon community survival. No one was gonna make it through those winters by themselves. They were gonna to have to work together, have to band together, function together as a family, as a clan, as a community, as a tribe, uh, that this was the key to survival and that the values that held the community together were the values that enabled it to survive. And yet, at the same time, it was also recognized that the community wasn't going to make it if, unless, it wasn't going to make it unless individuals were allowed from time to time to set out on their own, to venture out even into the unknown, to look for opportunities, to look for the things, the connections that would make it possible for the community to survive one more winter, one more year, uh, one more cycle of, of seasons. And so you get this interesting balance, even during the Viking Age, it's reflected in, the, in one of the, in the great works of medieval literature, the, the, the Norse sagas. You see this balance between, on the one hand, the strong belief and importance of community, of, of, of solidarity of the family and clan on the one hand, and at the same time, a recognition that individuals have to be free to follow their own courses, to follow their own paths for the benefit of the group. And this included women. This is one of the other things that we've discovered that was reflected in the Norse sagas, but the solid historical evidence wasn't there until recently in the archeological work and the DNA work. And we've come to realize the degree to which women in the Viking society had an enormous role to play, really unique in dark age Europe. And certainly compared to the Mediterranean civilizations in which the role of women had been segregated from the men, being, being, uh, being marginalized in terms of their rights uh, as members of the community here, very different in the Scandinavian setting where women enjoyed not political rights, they didn't participate in the 
uh, tribal assembly is the thing, which really was the governing force within the community, but, but they did have an important role to play uh, in terms of um, the way in which the economy worked and the household worked. That there was recognition in traditional Viking law for a limited role for divorce for women. It shocked outsiders that Scandinavian women could, could basically separate themselves from their husbands if they felt that their husbands were not up to the job uh, or were failing in their duties and obligations uh, towards, their, towards their spouses. Uh, and also to uh, limited rights of ownership of property. And we know as well, again, from the archeological evidence that they accompanied their men on their expeditions, uh, even on their expeditions across the North Atlantic. And as part of, North, of Leif Erikson's expedition, we know that women went along, were part of the voyage, undertook the same risks and dangers as their men. And we even know from, from recent, um, uh, examination of a warrior's grave in Birka, Sweden, that the Viking leader who was commemorated there and buried um, with the trappings of conquest and office uh, and leadership was in fact a woman. We now know this from the DNA. Uh, so the role of women in Scandinavian society, very different from the other parts of Europe. And it leaves its mark, it leaves its continuation on to the next age, we're gonna next slide. In the post Viking age, when Scandinavia slides back to becoming part of the, the margins of society, but as I describe in my book, we have three extraordinary women who come forward, who become part of the story of Scandinavia, the post Viking age, and who really shape not only the culture, but also come to shape the history of Scandinavia uh, uh, in, in those developments. The, the three outstanding ones being St. Bridget of Sweden, founder of the Brigentine Order, uh, Duchess Margaret of Norway, and then Queen Margaret I of Denmark, whose effigy at her tomb uh, is at Roskilde Cathedral is represented here in this photo supplied for me courtesy of the eye stock period you can see from <laughs> from the cat from the from the imprint that they've put on the on, on the slide sorry about that but it's an amazing amazing face and an amazing woman uh, who through sheer force of will was able to shape three kingdoms to her vision of a united Scandinavia and who manages to achieve before her death in 1412 the unheard of unheard of feat of bringing Norway, Sweden, and Denmark together as a unified kingdom uh, through the uh, Treaty of the, the Union of, of Kalmar, as it's called, uh, which she compelled her male inferiors and the uh, nobility to sign and ratify. Now, the Union of Kalmar didn't survive very long after her death. Uh, the three kingdoms went their own separate ways. Uh, by then, the linguistic unity that had been part of the Viking Age um, that, uh, that brought Norwegians, Swedes, and Danes together as speakers uh, of, of Old Norse um, and of using Old Norse for their runic inscriptions had faded. Languages had gone their three separate ways. But all the same, all the same, uh, even though the three kingdoms had their own now different community, different trajectories and their own destinies, the shaping of them by the Viking legacy of the, of the skill set built around community survival, but also allowing for individual freedom, including for women, in order to benefit the group, that would live on, and that was going to be part of the way in which Scandinavia would move from there. The other big change that comes in the post-Viking age, besides the development of three separate languages, is the coming of Christianity. And then with it also the coming of the Protestant Reformation, which in Scandinavia's case is, as you may well know, uh, is the Lutheran Reformation. Now this has an important cultural imprint because it does a great deal to, sh to shall we say, domesticate the Viking virtues and the Viking energy and drive 
It introduces the notions, for example, of conscience, the notions of compassion, um, of the idea of, of guilt uh, for you know, ferocious deeds committed in the spur of the moment in the battlefield and in combat for which one has to make, uh, make uh, restitution uh, and, and to and perform acts of penance. But the Lutheran Reformation, as I explain in the book, also left a different imprint too, because Martin Luther's theology, among other things, uh, was also centered on the, on the idea of the individual whose skills and ability and status in life had been given to them by God as a means by which to benefit the community as a whole. This was an extraordinary idea in many ways, because what it meant was is that the, that, the, that the holiness of life, the holiness of human pursuit was not limited to members of the clergy, which was very much part of the way in which Catholics and the Catholic church had been thinking about the role. The, the, the great separation between clergy on the one hand and, and, and the lay community, lay community uh, as a whole. But rather that every, every undertaking, every profession, every trade, every activity we engage in, in life, has a holiness, which is in a sanctity, which demands of us that we give to it our best, not just to benefit ourselves, but to benefit others, to benefit um, community, our family, but also others in the broadest sense here. And the idea of a life dedicated to hard work, to worldly success, as a form of expressing brotherly love, that's a big part of the Martin Luther's message. And it's one which I believe, and I argue in the book, very much absorbed by the Scandinavian community. And it makes Today, even though the numbers of Scandinavians go to, go to Lutheran church, go to church at all, is probably much smaller uh, than it was even 20 or 30 years ago. But the cultural imprint of the Lutheran Reformation, of seeing our lives and our works as a reflection not only of God's glory, but also as an expression of our love for others, uh, is an important part of shaping that. Scandinavian culture and Scandinavian cultural skill set in the modern age. It is one, for example, that definitely shapes the career of the man who I'm going to see, you're going to see me next in the next slide, uh, who is uh, the great Gustavus Adolphus, king of Sweden, who after he comes to the throne at the tender age of 18, 1611, becomes the greatest general, the greatest military gen general in Europe and who single-handedly saves Protestant Europe from the Catholic uh, Reformation during the course of the City of Youth, Thirty Years' War. Greatest military genius uh, of the age, man whose military leadership would be admired by Napoleon, by Frederick the Great, uh, by Oliver Cromwell, um, but who saw in his wars of conquest across Europe leading a crack Swedish army at its core, uh, as, as its fighting core, saw it as an expression again of, of the will of God, as an expression of, of desire of the Swedes, of their destiny to protect the other Protestant peoples uh, from the Catholic uh, onslaught brought on by the Habsburg monarchs. So for a period of time, as I talk about it in the book, Sweden emerges as Europe's great superpower. It's an extraordinary thing. It's a surprise to everyone, even to Swedes, that this in fact was, was made possible. But it was a tribute, first of all, to the genius of Gustavus Adolphus, um, and also to his prime minister, uh, uh, Count Oxenstierna. Uh, uh, and it's a legacy that was carried on then also by his great nephew, Charles XII, King of Sweden, who translated those military skills and the crack Swedish army into a fighting force that no other power could compete with. It allowed Charles XII at the end of the 17th century <laughs> to engage and conduct successful wars against the Russians, the Germans, the Danes, and the Poles, and all at the same time. Amazing, amazing military feat, amazing story. 
uh, which I talk about in the book, of course. But that century of conquests that Sweden was embarked upon and that would shape the face of Scandinavia in the 17th and the 18th centuries into the Age of Enlightenment came at a heavy cost. And that was is that the resources that were poured into empire building, into armies and navies, as part of that projection of power by not just the King of Sweden, but also the King of Denmark, uh, the members of the Oldenburg dynasty who take on, who see themselves as competing uh, on the European stage in, with other great powers like France and Britain, paid a price in terms of economic development. So that by the beginning of the 19th century, as Scandinavia's population begins to rise, um, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland are no longer able to feed all the mouths that, that they're facing. Um, and for Scandinavia's poor and poorest, there is no alternative except to leave, which they do, taking ships across the Atlantic as their Viking forebears had been. In this case, uh, four uh, square rigged sailing ships, not long ships. Um, but it's that immigration across the Atlantic to America that brings then the Scandinavian story to America and to and to the course of American history. Next slide, please. And this is this is a good sampling of the ones who came. Uh, these are Swedish lumberjacks, as it happens. A uh, photograph taken on a farm in Mora, Minnesota. Um, likewise, my grandparents, my Norwegian grandparents, who came shortly after these fellows were arrived, uh, again shortly before World War One, which was really the height of immigration from Scandinavia, about two and a half million Scandinavians total, Norwegians, Danes, Finns, and Swedes, who emigrated from the period of about 18, 1850s through to, uh, to the outbreak of World War I, which interrupted the transatlantic uh, crossings. But in the process, they brought with them, as these lumberjacks brought their skills in working in the great forests of Sweden and Finland, to uh, the great Northwest, they brought with them that same skill set, uh, the, the, the strong belief in family and community, but at the same time, a recognition that individuals have to go their own way and need the freedom to pursue their own direction uh, in order to benefit the community, in order to bring on business, to, to, to open new routes, to, 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 to plow new fields and open up new acreage in the process that this was an important part of, of what makes the community strong as well. And also to attend a, a, a strong belief in hard work. Um, what the Norwegian American um, uh, sociologist Thorstein Veblen would call the instinct for workmanship of a desire to always do better, to make something better. And that the next step of whatever is we're doing is one that will make it better and make it improve and so on. But this is also part of whether it's building a longship or fastening a battle axe, or whether it's again, plowing a field or opening a business or conducting a scientific experiment or even creating, creating a philanthropic foundation. At every step, you look for ways to perfect the process and perfect the final product that comes with it. These were the skills the Scandinavians brought with them as part of that experience. And in the second part of the book, as I talk about the emigration uh, and, this, and, and the ways in which those Scandinavian immigrants spread across the Northwest and became part of American history, um, including my great-great-grandfather during the Civil War. What we can see is, is that the Scandinavians are, in a sense, a community apart, but also one that fits well within the skill set demanded by the American experiment. Uh, the belief in liberty. This is one of the things that always drew the Scandinavians they were drawn to America because it was a republic. They fought in the Civil War because it was a war against slavery. They felt that need for freedom, the need for open acres, which God knows you couldn't get back home, but you could get in the Great Plains and in Minnesota and Iowa and Wisconsin and in the Dakotas, um, that that freedom was an important and imperishable heritage 
which needed to be fostered and needed to be supported wherever it happened. And so the fascination with freedom, next slide, please, would become an important part of their legacy for America as well. And one of the figures, the Scandinavian American figures I talk about at length in the book is the poet uh, Carl Sandburg, who, who's important as a poet, as a songwriter, as a song collector of folk songs, uh, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be underestimated. But whose major achievement was, I believe, his uh, multi-volume life of Abraham Lincoln, which was really shaped by his own experience growing up in the plains of, of Illinois, in Galesburg, Illinois, um, and that gave to his representation of Abraham Lincoln growing up uh, in Illinois, growing up in the prairie, in the first part of the book, The Prairie Years, um, a, a kind of authenticity, a belief in roots in that world, which carried over to the second part in his discussion of Lincoln as a war leader uh, during the course of the Civil War. And it's really those books that Th those volumes which, which, which won, him, won him the Pulitzer Prize, it's those volumes that really made Abraham Lincoln into the center of the American political pantheon to this day. And that made the Gettysburg Address, for example, which Sandberg cherished as one of the great moments of American oratory uh, and the story of American democracy, made it one of the central texts of the American democratic canon. Um, and of seeing the Abraham Lincoln as really the quintessential American, and that the ideals and the ideas that he brought to bear as president, as one that shaped the modern America. That's Sandberg's legacy. And it's as important as anything that other Scandinavian Americans, Charles Lindbergh's flight across, solo flight across the Atlantic, uh, Gutzon Borglum's uh, sculpting of Mount Rushmore, Newt Rockney's <laughs> leadership of the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame as a football coach that really established, as I described in the book, really established modern American sports, uh, not just at the collegiate level, but also at the professional level. But these are important legacies too, but Sandberg's may be the one that's the most precious for us today and the one that shapes us, shapes us in, in our political culture uh, in ways that we can't even really quite understand. And yet the Viking legacy isn't quite done. I'm going to mention one more slide, one more aspect of this. You go to the last slide. And that is the Norse sagas. These Norse sagas, and again, I have to stress that as a medievalist, I read a lot of medieval literature in Old English and in Old French and in Middle High German. There's nothing like the, like the Scandinavian sagas in terms of their representation of human drama, the human experience. But those sagas... Like, for example, the story of the hero Sigurd, shown here in the carving from a stock here, slaying, slaying the dragon Fafnir in order to gain the dragon's treasure. That that story in particular, which would be taken up and romanticized by the composer Richard Wagner for his ring cycle operas, but which would also be taken up by a certain professor of Old English who was a uh, fluent in Old Norse and fascinated by all things Scandinavian by the name of, of J.R. Tolkien. And it would be the basis for his ring cycle, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, uh, and the other works describing the world of Middle Earth. Middle Earth, of course, turned borrowed from Nordic uh, and Norse mythology. That those stories tell a universal message also, one that transcended that of the Norse sagas and transcended even the, 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 the powerful uh, images and music of, of Wagner's operas or of Tolkien's uh, ring uh, and, and, and characters of that epic, but would live on in Star Wars, that would live on in the superhero films uh, and in the in representation of Thor, for example, how many, six movies now that he's been in as a central character, audiences can't get enough of it. Can't get enough of the Star Wars trilogy. It's become part of a universal culture, universal epic culture, that its roots also lie in the story of the Vikings and the Viking legacy. And it's a story about how individuals have to, from time to time, undertake great risks, undertake 
risks even venturing into the unknown for the benefit, not only of themselves, but also for their families and for their communities. And that freedom, the freedom that does not, in effect, and enable and, and strengthen the community is not a freedom that is valued in the same way it is the one which is used to build not only for ourselves, but a freedom as an expression of that brotherly love, the, 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 the Lutheran message that comes through and that was seized upon and identified by Scandinavian culture because they recognized the way it resonated, resonated with their own, with their own uh, cultural roots and the way in which they had understood the relationship between community and freedom and individual freedom. But that's the most important legacy perhaps of all. The one I talk about at the end of the book and the one that I think makes the story of the Viking heart, as I call this cultural skill set, one which is very powerful, not only as an historical force, not only as a, a part of the American experience, but may really actually be part of the human experience that needs to be explored and understood. I'm done. Thank you very much for listening. All right. Thank you so much. There's some questions from the audience uh, as well, but I'll, I'm going to, I was just sort of me personally curious about the rela relationship between the Vikings and the Sami were, especially in the early histories. Um, yeah. If you. Well, the Sami are part of the, you know, part of the original Aboriginal inhabitants who moved into the, uh, into the Scandinavian peninsula at the, at, at the very end of the ice age. Um, and whereas the other original inhabitants who were part of that migration, and we're talking what about, probably about the, the 10th century, right? Before the Christian era. Um, while the other inhabitants then uh, settled in and developed and built farming communities, the Sami um, remained true to their nomadic roots and their hunter-gatherer roots. And so they become, in a sense, part of the part of the Scandinavian community that preserves its original cultural roots, right? Its original cultural roots, while the others move on and become more an agrarian and farming community in the process. Again, what is so striking about Scandinavia, and it's true for the Sami as much as it is for, for the other inhabitants there, is, is that <laughs> the first ones to go there are the ones who stay, <laughs> right? Um, no one wants to go to Scandinavia, right? Unlike other parts of the world, this is extraordinary. They're not conquered by others. No one wants to move to Scandinavia and, and settle there and establish there, quite the opposite. A large part of the history of ancient Scandinavia was people trying to get as far away as they could, you know, <laughs> moving south across the, the land bridge of Denmark into Northern Europe, which is what the Germanic tribes did. The Germanic tribes, the Franks and the Goths um, and, the, and the Lombards and the others were all escaping from that inhospitable environment. It's the one who's, ones who stuck it out, including the Sami. They're the really tough ones. And they're the ones who manage to manage to forge a culture that's that's built to not just survive but thrive into those kinds of in those kinds of conditions. Okay, so here's a question from Laurel. Uh, she says, "Good evening." Uh, she was wondering specifically how the DNA evidence you described earlier in your presentation has changed your understanding of Viking history. Uh, in her own family, the DNA test DNA test proved to have more ethnically. Uh, proved that our ethnically Scottish family has a lot more Scandinavian DNA than they originally thought. Yeah, I think that that's been more, that's been a typical surprise for many people. Yeah. Um, it does it in two ways. And I'll mention one in a more specific historical context, and then one almost in a philosophic context. The historical one is, is that just as, just as your questioner mentioned, his name was, I, I just forgot, um, as she just mentioned, um, is that people who had assumed that, they're, that they had Celtic roots uh, and or of Scottish or Irish descent, sometimes find out to the surprise that their DNA results show a lot of, of Nordic uh, and even Scandinavian uh, links. Um, and the, what this establishes from an historical context is the degree to which, again, the Vikings were not only, you know, shock and awe raiders, but were also settlers. 
and intermarried with and established communities uh, that mingled with the communities there, particularly in Ireland, but also in Scotland, and also inevitably uh, in Northern England. The problem, the problem with DNA research that we do in England uh, and the research that has really just gotten underway in the last, in the last decade or so, at least systematic work, is, is that it's very difficult to distinguish the DNA from Scandinavian uh, strains from Anglo-Saxon because <laughs> they come from the same place. <laughs> the Angles and the Saxons were also originally Scandinavians when they moved to conquer England. And so it becomes more difficult. It's, it's more difficult to differentiate the degree to which there was, but there must have been enormous, considered the large numbers of Danes who settled there the long period of time there. Uh, there has to be a strong a DNA link. But I'm going to mention the philosophic link too, Kyle, real quickly. And that is the other thing that we've discovered with DNA research of all kinds is that the old racialist based explanations for history, for group, the formation of cultures and groups has been completely blown away. That we come to know that the idea that racial theorists in the 19th century always held as the ideal, including, of course, the Nazis, but the idea of racially pure right, racially pure groups, and that racial purity was the key to strength and power as a culture, as a nation, um, it simply flies in the face of science, the biological science. And this is the case with the Scandinavians, we know this with the Vikings as well, that when we look at the DNA of Viking remains, and Viking graves, that what we see is, oh, again, a whole admixture of different, different ethnic origins, Finns and Slavs and Scots and English and so on. It's a it's a it's a racial mixing bag, a mixing pot here. Uh, and your typical Viking raid would not include simply you know Nordic uh, blonde Nordic types, but a whole range of, of of racial groupings and ethnic groupings at the same time. But who are bound together by a mission and by a commitment to carry that out. Uh, and, and to defy danger in order to achieve it. Okay, I'm going to combine these next two questions because they're almost similar, but a little different. Uh, Cliff is asking if if the various national groups of the Vikings marauded together or did they fight uh, each other for the lands and the spoils? And then Carol <laughs> is asking, uh, she's from Norwegian background and sure. her ancestors are saying that the Norwegian Vikings were the true Vikings. So. Um, Oh, yeah, don't 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 tell your Danish neighbors that. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't. They, they don't think that's going to go over very well. Um, first question. Um, yeah, he raises, that raises a really good point. And that is, is that for all of the stories and the way we talk about the Vikings as, as an historic peoples, right? Conquering mm -hmm. Northern Europe, attacking the English and the Irish and the French and the, and, and the uh, Slavs and the Byzantines that they spend a lot more time fighting among each other than they ever do attacking their attacking their non their non nordic non scandinavian member, members um, these are tribes and peoples who are constantly at war with each other again because <laughs> resources are scarce um, the 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 rewards of war can be can be uh, enormous uh, and the contention for leadership uh, is divided among multiple tribes at multiple times. Um, it's a tough life being a Viking chieftain, I gotta tell you, mm. because not only are you gonna be at war with your neighbors, you're also gonna be at war with members of your own family. Everybody is, is scheming to grab your position. And see, this is part of what, again, is, is, is almost unique in the Vikings of, in medieval Europe, is, is that their kings are never divinely anointed, right? That's the evolution of kingship for the rest of Europe is that you're king because God has willed it so. And a whole series of consecration ceremonies in order to guarantee that everyone understands that you were chosen by God and ordained by God to be king. This doesn't happen in the Scandinavian world or even in the post Viking world. Instead, it is kings are elected by the tribal assembly. Uh, that is a long tradition, and it's one that leads to, we would say, oh, isn't that great? You know, democratic values. You know, mm -hmm. leadership is at the consent of the governed. Well, that's true in a rather limited sense. What it really means is, is that 
leadership is always up for grabs and you constantly have to prove yourself in battle and in combat with your fellow Norwegians, but also against the Danes and also against the Swedes. And with regard to the Norwegians, yes, the Norwegians take on a big role, especially because of Leif Erikson and, and the voyages westward. They're very spectacular, very important. But let me tell you, the Swedish Vikings who penetrated down through Russia and who established the settlements of Kiev and Novgorod, who ventured out onto the Black Sea, besieged Constantinople, uh, served as bodyguards for the, for the Byzantine emperors, their stories just as glorious, just as amazing, uh, and just as uh, steep in steep in epic drama as anything Norwegians or or Danes managed to accomplish. I'm putting that in so that the Swedes in the audience will appreciate <laughs> my plot for the Swedish Vikings. All right, so this will be the last question. Um, and can you speak on the paradox of a Viking heart when it comes to if infant exposure? It's difficult to think any society that does this. Uh, that yeah. doesn't has any heart at all. Yeah, I think that's that's an excellent point. And when I talked about the changes that come with Christianity, that's going to be one of them, of course. No, the Viking heart, I mean, when I use that expression in talking about the Vikings, I'm talking about the, the most basic qualities, that indomitable courage, that taking risks, that sense of community solidarity. And of course, that sense of community solidarity includes an awareness of just how many mouths can be fed from the meager resources that are there. And that includes not just the very young, especially the very young females, but it's also going to include the very old as well. And once you cease to be part, <laughs> any use to the community, that's it for you. You're, you're done, for that, that your, your usefulness has ended. Christianity changes that. And that's part of the compassion degree that changes here. And so the Viking heart, I'm glad you asked this question because it, it, it's a part of the evolution of the book as I talk about it, even in, even in the preface, is that the heart itself comes to engage in those qualities that we think about as part of modern Scandinavia, for example. You know, our, our neighbors who are from Denmark or from Norwegian and Sweden, they're the last thing in the world you would think about when you think about a Viking, let alone a berserker. I mean, there's nobody, that, well, very few, who would fit anywhere near that description. They would seem quite the opposite. And yet, isn't it interesting that for all of their philanthropic and compassionate and empathic skills and their, you know, the, their, their outreach and their, uh, their, their sense of inclusion and tolerance for others and different lifestyles, that it's very hard to meet a Scandinavian today who isn't secretly, quietly proud of their Viking roots. You know, they, they're not ashamed of that past. They, oh, they recognize a lot of bloodshed and there's, there's ugly patches uh, and, and so on. But they realize that that Viking age and the Viking experience passed on the set of cultural gifts, which are still part of the Scandinavian experience. They've shaped Scandinavian history. As I explained in the book, they've shaped American history. And they're ones that I think if we can find ways to recover them for ourselves and find ways to identify and identify and, and explore those cultural values, they're going to be enormous, enormous value to us today and into the future as well. Well, that's it for tonight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Arthur, for this wonderful talk. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate it very much. Great questions, too. I love them. The link to purchase the book is in the chat. Uh, uh, you can purchase it at your independent bookstores or on online re retailers. It is available uh, throughout the US. So uh, I do encourage everyone to visit Scandinavia.org. We have a lot of interesting other book talks coming up, uh, more contemporary Nordic literature. Uh, we have a film series starting uh, next week. Uh, on a, a biopic on Sonia Henning. So do visit the uh, website to see what we are having to offer. So, and again, thank you very much for uh, tuning in tonight. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone soon, either virtually or in person. Good night. <laughs>